So today's presentation about is about coastal erosion or stuff that's getting moved around by the ocean or the stuff that is actually moving around in the ocean. And we think about the coast, you think about going to the beach and we know a beach is a bunch of sand sized sediments that wind up at that particular location. But let's back up and think about where did those sediments come from and how did they get there? So back here, I've got a waterfall and that land is really steep. The water is moving really fast, which means it can move a lot of stuff and it does. You can see even some of the big rocks that this water was able to move because there's a lot of water and it's moving really fast. We can see how much it has cut into the ground and how much material this moving water has moved. Well, where does most moving water wind up? In the ocean, and that's the ocean back there. The ocean's not moving very fast. And when this fast moving water hits the ocean, it basically just stops. Well, slow moving water can't hold as much or move as much stuff as fast moving water. So this water is moving a lot of stuff, carrying a lot of sediment, and right when it gets there, it stops and it can't hold it anymore. So what does it do? It drops it. You'll notice that pile of stuff, that dirt, that's all the stuff that this fast moving water couldn't move anymore once it stopped. That process is known as deposition. Deposition is the dropping of sediments. And this usually occurs where water slows down and it's slower and it can't move sediments as easily, so it has to drop them. So we think about the Chattahoochee River and here's a picture of it after it rains. It's got a bunch of dirt, sand, silt, and clay in it. It's moving a bunch of sediments. And most of that sediment is going to be carried to the ocean. You can actually see it. A lot of times you can actually see in the ocean the sand, silt, the clay that's being moved around when the river is taking that stuff there to the ocean. And you see it a lot more there at the ocean because bam, it hits a wall and the water kind of stops and therefore it starts to drop the sediments and they start to pile up. Now let's think about the Mississippi River. We know that there's a huge watershed and it's carrying about 41% of all of the surface water drainage in the United States. Well, it's gonna pick up a lot of stuff and a lot of that stuff is going to wind up wherever the Mississippi River winds up, which is in the Gulf of Mexico. So if you go to Louisiana, which is where the Mississippi River winds up. You can actually see it in satellite images, all of that sand, silt, clay stuff that the Mississippi River is dropping to the tune of 2.4 billion kilograms of stuff into the Gulf of Mexico. The state of Louisiana is actually there because the Mississippi River was dropping all of that stuff and it piled up because it stops and it has to drop all that sediment. The Mississippi River used to come straight this way. But over time, it has dropped sediments here, and then the pile got bigger. The pile keeps getting bigger. And Louisiana keeps getting bigger because that river is still bringing stuff and dropping it right there where it meets the ocean. So let's look at what does the water in the ocean do once all that stuff gets there? Because there is erosion along the coast once the stuff is there. Now you can see, if you've been to the beach, all that stuff there, all that sand is gone. You can see there's a there's a drop off here. There was sand here. Where'd it go? Well, the water must have moved it around. We know that's erosion. The ocean can do this as well as rivers and streams. You can actually see it once again, that all of that sand that is being moved around by the water in the ocean. We know the water in the ocean is still moving. There's waves. There's wind and there's ocean currents, so there is some movement still, so stuff is still going to get moved around. Now, the same holds true for the ocean as it did on uh, surface water courses like rivers and streams, and that is the factors that affect the amount of erosion is the amount of water and the speed of water. So how can the ocean cause so much erosion? Well, the water's moving real slow, but remember, the ocean is a big bucket of water. There's a lot of water. So the more water you have, the more erosion you can have. Plus, we're 
primarily talking about sand being moved, which is pretty small stuff. And we know that small stuff can get moved easily. The ocean's not going to push around boulders or cobble or usually even pebbles, but it can push around this small stuff like sand, silt, and clay pretty easily. But how does the amount of water in the ocean change, which would change the amount of erosion? Well, if you think about high tide versus low tide, and you're at one particular spot in the ocean, at one time you can see there'd be less water, and at another time there'd be more water. So the amount of water is constantly changing with the high and the low tide. So you're going to be able to get stuff being moved around because, oh, there's not much water. Now here comes more water, which is going to cause more erosion. What about the speed? Remember that the speed of the ocean is primarily caused by waves, which are driven by wind. And we know there's always generally at least some amount of wind at the shore. So the ocean water is going to be moved to some velocity, to some speed by that wind that's almost always there. The question is how much? Now, we know that one side of an island or one coast versus another is going to have more or less wind. We get the windward side versus the leeward side. On the windward side of the island of Aruba, you see tons of erosion. You can actually see, hey, there was some rock there. There was some rock here. It's now gone. It's been moved. And you can see the waves out there. They're, they're pretty choppy. The water's foamy. It's faster moving water because we're on the windward side of the island and we get hit with more waves there, which makes faster moving water, which is going to move more stuff. Now on the leeward side, where the winds are blowing this way, they're blowing offshore. So we don't get many waves because the wind's blowing the wrong direction to push waves onto the shore. And what do you notice? You notice less erosion on this side. As a matter of fact, on this side, we see lots of deposition because the water's moving so slow on this side, it's a lot more apt to drop stuff than it is to pick up and move stuff. And you can see that in this case here, all that sand that has just been dropped on the leeward side of the island. You can see it from the air. You can see how shallow the water is over there because that's the leeward side where the winds are not blowing and making a lot of waves so the water's kind of still and a lot of sand gets dropped so this side is very deep because you have a lot of waves driven by the larger amounts of wind that move sediments away and so the water ends up being deeper because the sand is moved easier because of the high speed of the ocean due to the winds on that side of the island same is true with most islands here's grand cayman you notice the one side of the island this is the windward side lots of waves lots of rocks not much sand on the leeward side is where you're going to have the beaches because there's not much wind not much waves and sand actually gets dropped which makes nice big beaches now hurricanes hurricanes change the game entirely we know that hurricanes are these big huge storms and they push a lot of water up on shore due to the high winds so a hurricane can cause a huge amount of coastal erosion in a very short period of time. Here's some before and after pictures of hurricanes. And you'll notice the size of that island and it seems to be gone because a hurricane came ashore with a lot more water, a lot faster water, a lot more waves and was able to move the sediments away. Same is true here. This is very typical before and after hurricanes where you see you have some sand in one place and then it's gone. It is moved or eroded because of the high amounts of water and the high speed of the wind. This is Long Beach, New Jersey. After Hurricane Sandy, you can see they had a nice wide sandy beach. They had lots of sediments there. The hurricane came along and now they were gone, which is not great news for the people that want to go to Long Beach, New Jersey and play on the beach. Now, there are some particular patterns to how this happens. First of all, we want to talk about is longshore drift. And we got to go back to the waves. Remember, it's the waves pretty much that are driving the movement of sand. And the waves are driven by the wind. And wind doesn't necessarily hit the coast 
at 90 degrees. If you've been to the beach, you know that when you're playing in the waves, the wave doesn't come and all hit the beach at exactly the same time. It has kind of a rolling pattern. Hey, the, it starts breaking over here on the left, and eventually the, the part of the wave on the right comes to the beach, and that's because waves typically hit the shore, not straight on, but at some angle. Well, as they hit the sand, if they hit the beach at an angle, they're going to push sand this direction or whatever direction the waves are hitting the beach. And the waves generally hit the beach kind of the same pattern because it's driven by the winds and we have usually fairly set wind patterns. That is called longshore drift. Longshore drift is the pattern of sand movement parallel to the shore. And it's because waves don't hit the beach perpendicular. And you'll see it here. Here's a river that's bringing a lot of sediment and it's piling it up right here. But because the waves are pushing the beach this way, you can see my pile of sand is going this direction, which makes the water have to go around it. A lot of rivers actually have this shape to them when they meet the ocean. They don't meet it at 90 degrees because of that longshore drift keeps pushing the sand and then the, therefore the river has to change position. So what can we do about all this stuff? Well, if you lose your beach, big storm comes along or just the natural ocean tides and currents, you don't wanna not have a beach, especially these beach towns. So you can do what's called beach nourishment, which is you put back the sediments that the ocean moved. And it's a pretty, I mean, logistically, it's a simple process that you just go get some sand and you dump it on the beach. Sometimes you'll see a situation like this where you got a, a boat that has gone offshore and scooped up some sand off the bottom of the ocean and they literally just throw it back up on the beach. Then you have a bulldozer and people that kind of groom it and spread it out. This happens a lot of places that are beach towns that rely on their beach for their economy. You want, you go to the beach, you go to Cancun, you go to Florida because you want to go play on the beach. Well, if you don't have a beach, it's kind of bad for business. So places that have lost their beach will undergo beach nourishment. They will go bring in some sediments and put new sand down if they've lost the sand they had to begin with. Now, there's some pros and cons to doing this. All right. First and foremost, you can always ensure you're going to have a beach. You can always put the sand back. But it is very expensive. It can be up to a million dollars per mile to do beach nourishment, depending upon how nice a sand do you want? How much do you need? Because if you think about beaches, not all sand is the same. If you want the softest, fluffiest, whitest sand, well, that's the best stuff. You're going to have to pay more for it. It also disrupts the natural movement of sediments. Anytime we get in there and we start fooling with nature, there are going to be some other consequences. And if the ocean took your sediments once, it's probably going to do it again. So you're going to have to do this over and over again, especially if you have things like a hurricane. A hurricane comes and takes your beach and you're like, fine, okay, and you put more beach back. Oh, what if they have a hurricane the next year? Well, then you got to do it over again. So why would you go through all of that trouble? Well, if you're a beachfront community like Long, Long Beach, New Jersey, this hotel right here, Maybe charges $200 a night during the summer for people to come and stay in their hotel because they want to play on this beach. Well, if you notice in this picture here, there's no beach left. Nobody's going to come and spend $200 a night to stay in that hotel if there's no beach. They're going to go someplace else with there is a beach. Hotel goes out of business. And not just the hotel, but the restaurant over here, the gas station over here. All of their business is dependent on people who want to come and be on the beach. So you have to undergo beach nourishment if your economy is driven by tourists that are coming to the beach. So it is worth it sometimes to do that million dollars per mile. And who pays? Everybody in that area will pay to put the beach back because if they don't, they go out of business. Now, Jekyll Island, Georgia is a special case study in coastal erosion. Like all islands, Jekyll has this longshore drift going on where the sand is being pushed down the coastline. But Jekyll's different. It's a state park. 
you can't do beach nourishment there because it must remain in a natural state. So, because of this long shore drift, there are now places on the island that don't have much beach left. This is high versus low tide at Jekyll. And Jekyll's got some pretty extreme tides. A lot of water coming in and out every day. It means there's going to be a lot of beach erosion. And you can see over here, we, we got we got some sand, but it's not fluffy sand. It, it's the sand that's underneath the water. Now the water's gone. Yeah, I go out and be on the sand. But at high tide, you'll notice there's no beach. Well, this means if you want to go play in the sand at Jekyll Island, you have to time your beach activities with the high and the low tides. Let's say you go out to the beach and you're you know, chilling out here on the beach, laying out, getting a suntan, and the tide comes in. Whoa, hey, now I'm out, I'm out of a beach. That's kind of a pain. Now, the movement of the water has taken away the sand. And behind the sand, they will pile up these piles of rock to help protect the buildings that are over there. They can do things like this to stop any more erosion if it endangers a structure, a house or a hotel. But they can't go back and put the beach, the artificially make a beach because it's a state park. You can actually see it in Jekyll Island. This part of Jekyll Island has almost no beach at all. Very rocky, all the way down to about here. Uh, the beach is disappearing. The sand is being pushed down this way. And you can see here, you can kind of see in that picture, you can see there's a little bit wider stretch of sand from about here all the way down. And here's the ironic part with Jekyll Island. Jekyll Island is an older uh, beach destination goes back to the very wealthy industrials of the uh, Industrial Revolution, the Vanderbilts and the Carnegies and people like that. Rich industrialists from the north would come down to Jekyll Island and they built their beach houses and their resorts and stuff up here. And there are a fair amount of hotels and houses and stuff all along the north side of the island. And now 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years later, hey, their beach is gone and their houses are in danger because of longshore drift. There were almost no hotels and resorts built on the southern end of the island because all the rich people chose to build up here. They didn't know that their beach was going to shift. Ironically, the south part of the island was the poor side of the island. It was where the servants lived. The lower income people lived. And now it's kind of ironic that that's the end of the island that has the biggest, nicest, widest beaches. And it's because of this longshore drift. Now, how do we control it? Well, I showed you, you can use riprap again. All right, so back there, we've got the ocean. We know the ocean is a lot of water moving around. It's going to pick up sediments and try to move them. The people that live in these houses back here probably don't want the ground underneath their houses to be carried away by the ocean because then their homes would fall into the sea. So let's look at something that can be done in order to reduce the amount of coastal erosion. What we have here are a bunch of big rocks that were put right next to the ocean. We know what these big rocks are called. They're called riprap. And how are these working right here is very similar to one of the ways in which they're used in freshwater. These rocks are too big to be moved by the ocean. The ocean is never going to get moving that fast. So no matter how much water comes up here on shore, it can't take these rocks and move them away. If the rocks weren't here, it could probably take away this dirt pretty easily. And it would keep taking away the dirt until it got up there to underneath the houses. So once again, we can use riprap or really big rocks along the coast which are too big for the ocean to move, and hence it limits erosion. Sometimes just big rocks isn't enough, and you'll see these structures along the shore. They look like big concrete jacks, and these are a lot more stable. They interlock with one another. This is used when places have an extreme amount of erosion, and they have to do something more than just big rocks. Now here's riprap that's placed along the shore. And what this does is it makes water slow down. So the water is able to go past the water coming ashore, but then it has to go over those speed bumps before it comes over here and hits the main part of the sand. Well, we know that slower water 
can't remove as much sediment as fast water. Now there's some disadvantages to doing this right here. Obviously now you got a bunch of rocks on your beach, but it does help keep some of this sand behind the beach in place. So summarize riprap works one of two ways, just like it does in a river or a stream. It makes water slow down so it can't pick up the stuff. We're talking about sand here at the beach, or it's stuff that's too big that the water can't move. Now here's a case where Somebody was having some real serious coastal erosion problems in California. And I said, hey, we, we don't want this stuff over here at the bottom of my cliff to be removed because my cliff is going to fall. So they put the riprap in there to try to make the water slow down. And you can kind of see why or who did this. These people up here don't want this part of their cliff to be gone because then their houses will fall into the ocean. But sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes erosion still wins. And that was the case in this apartment building in Pacifica, California. The ocean's so much water, and you're in a place where the waves are pretty big and they come all the time, and they lost the battle. Here's a parking lot in San Diego. And I wanna point out this picture. Notice how this looks kind of jagged here. It doesn't look like Somebody took the time to really pave the parking lot evenly. Well, they did. Parking lot used to be out to here. And this was parking space. It was pavement. But the ocean kept taking away sediments. And eventually it took out the land from underneath the parking lot. The parking lot broke. It basically fell down. And the government in this area said, well, wait a minute. We don't want to keep losing our parking lot. So they came in and they put some big rocks, some riprap. So now that when the water comes in, it can't move those rocks and my parking lot's not gonna break down and fall into the ocean anymore. Now you can also take this riprap and you can arrange the rocks in special patterns that can change how you want the water or where you want the water to do something with sediments. First we're gonna look at, it's called a groin. A groin is a pile of rocks or a wall that is placed perpendicular to the shore. My, it is perpendicular, meaning at 90 degrees. And here's how this works. We know that the ocean is trying to push sand a long ways down the coast, parallel to the beach. So my sand starts moving this way. Water keeps moving my sand, say it's going this direction. And I don't want my beach to disappear. Maybe my house or my hotel is right there. I want to keep some sand in front of my beach house or hotel. So I build a wall or a pile of rocks called a groin. And basically, this makes the sand pile up right here. And it keeps some sand in this area as opposed to going way far away where I can never get it back. So you'll see repeated patterns of these groins. And you can see how it traps the, the sand. The water must have been moving this way. Here's the groins and it piled up the sand. And you can go back and you can spread that sand out and make it a little bit more even. And that's a heck of a lot easier to do to just move around sand in a small area like this than once it's gone completely away or down the coast. So now something else to consider is if a groin makes waves drop the sand, where the water has picked it up, what if we can keep the water from even picking up the sand to begin with? So if we make the water go slower, it means it won't be able to move the sand in the first place. Okay, so here I am at the beach. I'm in Montego Bay, Jamaica. If you'll see behind me, okay, there's so the ocean and there's nothing to block the wind. So the wind blows fast across the ocean and it makes waves without anything to block the wind or make it slow down, you get a lot of wave action. And you can see behind me there, the frequency of the waves. Well, those waves are going to hit the shore. And when they do, they're gonna move some of the sediment, some of the sand around. All right, so now here I am on the shore and you can see behind me, there's the water line and look at all of that sand that has been removed because of the action of the waves. Now. This big fancy hotel behind me, they don't want to lose any more sand because the beach is the reason why people come here. So they have to do something 
to make it so that the waves can't pick up and move the sand. Here's one of the things that can be done. They've piled some concrete blocks up here in a line parallel to the shore. Now this is called a breakwater. Basically what it does is it makes the waves slow down. It's like a speed bump for waves. And you can see the waves breaking over the, the breakwater behind me. Now what that does is when the waves get on this side of the breakwater, they're not moving so fast. And slower water can't pick up and grab that sand and take it away. So this hotel manages to keep their beach intact. So once again, a breakwater is a pile of rocks or concrete. It's a wall built parallel to the shore that makes waves slow down so that they can't pick up and remove as much sediments or sand. So let's look at this example of a breakwater and notice the speed and how much the water is sloshing around on this side of the breakwater. But yet, we're gonna come over here and we're gonna go to the other side and we're gonna see that the water over here is just dead calm. So that's what a breakwater does. It makes the water slow down so that we don't have as much erosion problems. Here's a breakwater in Honolulu, Hawaii. Honolulu, Hawaii, big time beach destination. They want to keep their sand in place. So they constructed this wall here. You see it's a concrete wall that makes the water on this side go slow. And you can see it in the picture. Look how big the waves are over here. Faster moving water, yet once they hit that wall and go over the top, they gotta to slow down, gonna cause less erosion. Here you can see an aerial shot and you'll notice how much sand is back here behind the breakwater. Over here, not nearly as much sand. So these breakwaters, they work. So sometimes rocks and plants aren't enough to stop erosion from waves. Notice back here, we've got some very big, powerful waves that are gonna do a lot of damage, cause a lot of erosion. So let's look at an extreme case. You do something like this. You build a concrete wall. This is called a seawall, and it is just what it says it is. It's a wall that's meant to stop erosion from the sea, and it's done when other things can't solve the problem for you. So let's talk about some advantages and disadvantages of seawalls. Obviously, the ocean waves aren't gonna be able to take that away. So it'll work, it'll stop the erosion. This guy's house is not gonna fall into the ocean. That's a good thing. Let's talk about the bad things. Well, they're expensive. It's a big mound of concrete that you had to pay somebody to make. You also lose basically any beach. This guy's got a 10 or 12 foot drop from his house because he can't have any just sand there anymore to make a beach. They also have a limited lifespan. Eventually, over time, the water from the ocean, if it hits this enough, will actually break down this wall and you have to replace it. You can see that right here. You'll notice that the wall looks like it's starting to break up because the water from the ocean hits this enough and it's gonna break the seawall apart. So another disadvantage is they have a lifespan and they're gonna have to be replaced, which is expensive. Do they work? Yes. Are they the best option? Maybe not. They have some distinct advantages and disadvantages. Here's another seawall example. You can see they basically just paved the whole slope right along the water to keep the water from taking the beach away. Some other examples, the one on the right is from a lake in Louisiana. So the lakes even can get moving fast enough to take away the sediments. You can see the one on the left. You can see why they had to have this seawall because here's a place where the waves are really, really violent. And that's the only thing that would make the waves slow down enough to where it wouldn't cause so much erosion. Now, you don't have to have big waves. Any movement of water in the ocean can pick up and move stuff. And this is in Florida. 
And we know that the ground in Florida is very, very sandy. Well, this water here is pretty still, but even just the fact that the tide goes up and the tide goes down is going to take away a little bit of sand every time. And this guy doesn't want the sand underneath his house to move, so he built this seawall right here. And it's not much, but it's enough to keep the sand in place. So what if the waves are dropping sediments where we don't want them? That can be just as bad as taking them away in the first place. We can see back here, there's a bunch of sand back there, a bunch of sand back there. And even though it's back behind this island, you know the water comes in and it goes out every time with the changing of the tides. And we're getting some sand pushed back here. Well, maybe I don't want sand back there. I've got a marina. I've got a boat channel. I don't want it to fill up with sand because then I can't drive my boat in that location. Here's Blind Pass, which is Sanibel Island, Florida. And you can see the bridge and you can see how the water typically comes this way. Well, something has happened. We've had a bunch of deposition. Now we've got a bunch of sand that has filled up this area. And this is not good because now I can't move this way on my boat. And if this fills up too much with sand, the next time I have a big storm, the water might go up and over that sand and cover up my road. So this is a bad situation. How do we fix it? Well, the first thing you can do is you can dredge. And dredging is a pretty, you know, physically it's a simple process. You put a crane out there on a barge and you reach down in, under the water and you scoop up or you suck up some of the sand and then you take it away. You can do it, but you can imagine the cost and the hassle that it takes to do this. It's not a cheap option. It's better off to stop the sediments from being put there where you didn't want them in the first place. Well, how do we do that? Well, here's Blind Pass in Sanibel in 2017. You'll notice now it's clear. The water can go in and out. Now they dug up all the sand that was there, but this is what they've done to keep more sand from getting deposited. They built a, uh, a groin right here. So now as the sand gets pushed down the beach, it piles up here and doesn't pile up right there where it will block the channel. So here we have the Noyo River in Northern California, and this is where it meets the sea. Now, just so this way on this river, river, on the other side of this bridge, is a very large marina with lots of boats parked there, both pleasure boats and commercial fishing boats. And those people need to park their boats in deep water. Well, the problem is the ocean out there is constantly pushing sediments and sand back and forth. And we don't want the sand to come this way and clog the river and make our marina too shallow for our boats to park. So what they've done here is they built this structure here and this structure here. This is a wall and this is a pile of rocks. They are both called jetties. J-E-T-T-Y. A jetty is a wall or a barrier that is meant to stop sand from being deposited in a ship channel or in a harbor or marina. And you can see how this thing is working. If you see over here, look at all of that nice sandy beach over there. All of that sand might have been pushed into here and made my ship channel too shallow for the boats to get in and out. So you see that a jetty is a wall or a barrier of rocks that is meant to stop sand from being dropped where we don't want it, specifically in a ship channel or in a marina. So let's talk about the importance of sand dunes at the beach. A sand dune is just a big pile of so naturally occurring sand, usually up from the water line. And how these formed was wind or water has blown a pile of sand up here. Now it makes like a little hill. The plants grow on it and the roots from the plants help hold that hill together. Well, why are these so important? Well, they're huge for fighting erosion. 
because when a bunch of water comes on the shore from a storm or an exceptionally high tide, it's gonna pick up the sand and it's gonna try to move it over there. It's gonna cover up my road, go into my houses. I don't want that. But when the water hits this little mound of sand, this beach dune, it has to slow down. It can't get over the top of it sometimes. So it drops its sand right here. The same is true when the wind blows. The wind picks up some of the sand and it hits this little hill and it drops the sand right here. These sand dunes are very important for keeping our sand in place on the beach where we want it. Now, just like our rivers and streams and, and our on the surface erosion control, plants can make a huge difference. So let's talk about coastal erosion and what can be done to help lessen coastal erosion. We know that slower water means less erosion than faster water. And the speed of the water in the ocean is primarily caused by the waves, which is from the wind. And you'll see behind me, there's a lot of open ocean back there with lots of wind that is gonna make the water just keep going faster and faster. So when that water hits the shore, it's gonna be able to grab and move a lot more sediments. And we don't want that. The question is what can be done to make water in the ocean or water from waves slow down? One thing that can be done to make water slow down is to stop cutting down all of the plants at the shore. You can see how choppy this water is, and this water is being pushed right up against this line of plants. These are mangroves along the Florida coast. And traditionally, we cut all these down, and we filled in sand, and we made beaches. But then there was nothing to keep this water from coming and grabbing our sand and taking it away. What these trees do, what these mangroves, what these plants can do is make the water slow down. And you can see from how choppy the water is out there to how calm it is in here. These plants and trees left along the shore can help make water slow down. And slow water does not cause as much erosion as fast water. So behind me here is a sand dune, and we know how important these sand dunes are to help protect locations so along the shore from storm surge from a hurricane. You can see there's the ocean, it's pretty flat, and when a hurricane comes ashore, it pushes a lot of water onto the land, and it's going to knock my house down. These sand dunes act as like a speed bump or a wall to help stop hurricane storm surge. So these are very important, we want to leave them in place. But erosion comes into play here. Sand gets moved very easily because it's really, really small. So we need something to help hold this sand dune in place, otherwise the wind is gonna blow it away. And that's where those plants come into play. You know that plants have roots that really hold the soil, or in this case, sand, in place. So those plants are the only thing holding that mound of sand right there. If the plants were gone, the wind would blow right over the top of the sand dune and start to slowly blow it away. So very frequently you'll go to the beach and you'll see signs that say, don't walk on the dunes. Because what they don't want you to do is kill those plants. If everybody walked on the plants, they would die. The plants die, the wind's able to blow away the sand dunes, and we lose our protection along the shore due to hurricanes. So now you understand why you see these signs at the beach and why you should heed their warnings and stay off the dunes. Now, here we've got two things going on. This is in North Myrtle Beach where erosion is a problem and this is the modern part of Myrtle Beach and they have done things here to help prevent erosion. They have left the dunes in place and they left plants on the dunes and they built their stuff way back from the water. So in this area, even if water gets past the dunes, it has a place to go and hang out before it goes and settles in our hotels and our homes and our condos. In Hawaii, where they're constantly getting new beaches made, they actively go along and they plant coconut trees, palm trees, as quick as possible because they know they need something to help hold the sand in place and lessen erosion. 
Now, another problem is the wind at the beach. So here I am on the nice white sandy beach, and I like my beach. I like my sand right here. So here but I, I know there's also always going to be a wind here at the beach because of the temperature difference between the water and the land. So the wind is going to be able to move my sand around very easily, and I don't want that. I want to keep my beach in place. I also don't want my sand to be blown back there across the road and up against those houses. So the question becomes, how do we stop beach erosion from wind? One of the things we use are these devices back here. These are called sand fences. And how they work is you can see that the wind can go through that. It's not a solid wall, but when the wind hits that sand fence, it has to work its way through the fence, it slows down a little bit. And the sand it is carrying hits the sand fence and it gets dropped right there. So it keeps my sand here on the beach as opposed to being blown away. So now you know what these structures are. You've probably seen these before along the beach. They're a sand fence and they're a help meant to lessen erosion from wind along the coast.